Thank you for downloading this Council on Foreign Relations video. CFR is an independent national membership organization and nonpartisan research center. For more information, please visit us online at CFR.org. Uh, welcome to the latest event in the Foreign Affairs Live series. Uh, we are very, very pleased tonight to have with us an extraordinary uh, cast and an extraordinary topic. Um, let me start with a couple of prefatory remarks. My name is Gideon Rose. I'm the editor of Foreign Affairs, and I think officially this evening a grup, um, for those of you who liked <coughs> Star Trek. I'm a, I feel very old uh, with all the, uh, not just the topic, but the, uh, uh, the various <coughs> technological means of, of uh, covering it and delivering it, as Foreign Affairs really is not just talking about social media and digital issues, but living the, living the life, walking the walk. So uh, a few things for you to know. First, uh, unlike usual, you are not going to be asked to, silent, to uh, turn off uh, your cell phones <laughs> and your computers. This is not a plane uh, taking off. Uh, you should silence them so they don't bother others. But if you feel moved to tweet, to uh, do any of the other, to post, to do any of the other things you may do with your computer, I don't think we're allowed to be watching porn in here, but anything else you want to do with your computer <laughs> is fine. Uh, and the more, the merrier. Um, you should know about our new mobile site, uh, which is really uh, a great reading experience on your smartphone. Uh, you should know that we have a digital subscription uh, that's uh, been launched in which you can allow, download digital copies of each issue and uh, uh, read them on your iPad or other tablets. Uh, we also have a Plus subscription, which allows you to get all of our web content, uh, which we have lots of. Uh, and if you don't know about our web content, you should. Um, and, of course, you should follow us on Twitter and fan us on Facebook so that we can poke you and you can poke us and whatever other kind of things you do. Um, uh, this event and all FA Live events uh, will be posted on foreignaffairs.com and on YouTube and our channel there so you can share and comment on it and come back and revisit it for future reference should you uh, want to. Uh, with that, let me just uh, say a little bit about our speakers and get right to the topic. We're going to have a discussion up here for the first half of the hour and then have a discussion with all of you for the second half of the hour. We have some wonderful questions already from Twitter and Facebook that we'll be starting out with, and uh, we'll move it forward. Uh, my guests this evening are two uh, friends uh, and an extraordinarily accomplished people. Uh, I knew them when they were before they were extraordinarily accomplished, <laughs> so it's great fun to, uh, to see them become the big stars and, uh, uh, and mockers that they've actually become. Uh, Anne-Marie Slaughter uh, is uh, uh, not just uh, uh, one of the major scholars uh, in international relations and American foreign policy, uh, but also uh, uh, recently completed a stint as the director of policy planning at the State Department. Uh, she is George Kennan's heir. Uh, and it really is, the, you know, there are a few people who actually uh, in fill those large shoes, and Anne-Marie is, is one of them, and we're delighted to have her. She's now back at Princeton. We're delighted to have her here uh, in her almost semi-recent official category uh, and capacity. Uh, Clay Shirky uh, is a new media guru. He's a professor at NYU. Uh, he is uh, well known to legions of fans. He's been a new media guru uh, for as long as I've known him, before that was even an official job category. And I have to say I'm a little bit puzzled as to when it became an official job category, but since that epithet has always attracted uh, to his name and attached to his name, uh, somehow he managed to live up to it. Uh, what we're going to be he's also the author of a blockbuster article in our Jan Feb issue, of course, called uh, The Political Power of Social Media, uh, which uh, kicked off a ruckus and was a huge uh, 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 entry into the uh, debate over just what role uh, internet freedom, political uh, communication, social media, and so forth have in driving political change. Uh, he, of course, called and, in fact, caused the revolutions in the <laughs> Middle East, and uh, oh, we'll talk about that uh, in a bit. Uh, so why don't we start off, Clay, for the three people here who might not have actually uh, read and studied and memorized your piece, with a very short precy of what you argued in your piece and uh, what the criticism was from people like Malcolm Gladwell and others and, and why they're wrong and you're right. <laughs> All right. I'll see if I can do that short. So the, uh, the piece essentially lays out why a medium that's natively good at group forming, which is to say the Internet allows for 
not just one-to-many communications like television or one-to-one communications like the telephone, but also many-to-many communications, a group of people communicating together, why that will have political and social ramifications. And I think like a lot of articles in Foreign Affairs, it was really two different articles in one. One was a laying out of that principle, uh, and the other was, a, was a, an uninvited memo to the State Department. So I'll talk about them in, those, uh, in, in that order. The basic principle is that the Internet, in my, in my accounting, has three primary effects on the media landscape. Uh, the first one is it is, is as, as, as Bob Rubens famously said, a massive positive supply side shock to the cost and availability of information. It's simply unbelievably much easier to get a, a vastly increased amount of information. Uh, the second effect is amateur access to the public sphere, the ability of citizens to speak oh. out loud in a way that more people can hear them than you could gather around a dinner table. Uh, and the third is the ability of groups to coordinate their activities, to use the fact that they've got, we've got a medium that is both many-to-many -many and relatively rapid to synchronize uh, to, or to, to, coordinate, to coordinate action. So that's, that's the basic catalog of large-scale effects of the Internet on the, on the media environment. And, and when I say the Internet, I include mobile phones because they are increasingly tied into that network, not just in the sort of iPhone 4 configuration, but also with people being able to use Internet tools to rebroadcast messages from SMS, uh, photos, video, and so forth. The basic thesis of the piece is that when you're looking at poli the political effects of these tools, we have systematically tended to over overestimate the value of access to information uh, in, in many cases when we're talking about, uh, for instance, the events in the Middle East and North Africa, there's a notion that we here in America have the source code to democracy. If only we could reduce censorship, people could download it and compile it in their local conditions. Uh, that the, There is some value, political value, to the access to information, but less than we have believed, and that we have systematically underestimated the value of access to each other that, in fact, amateur access to the public sphere and group coordination turn out, to be the important, uh, turn out to be the important tools. And so if I had to recontextualize those three effects of the Internet in, in, in the political framework, it would be that these tools allow publics that were previously dispersed and disconnected from one another to synchronize their opinions, coordinate their actions, document the results. And that those effects, all of which we've seen unfold in, in, in the revolutions in Tunisia and, and Egypt and in the insurgencies in Libya, Yemen, Bahrain, I won't do the whole list, um, all of those effects have, have, have been present and all of those effects are, are structurally important. The memo to the State Department part has been that state, whatever its actions are, has rhetorically overemphasized uh, helping dissidents penetrate the firewall, helping dissidents get access to information, and underemphasized giving dissidents the ability to coordinate with one another, the, the buildup of civil society. And also a message, and one that, that Anne, Anne Marie and, and, and I were at, sat down at, at dinner shortly before the famous Internet Freedom Speech, a, a dinner to which she had kindly invited me a little over a year ago. And at the time, I didn't believe this, but I've since, I've since sort of change my mind about this, I don't believe it's readily possible to weaponize social media, which is to say, even understanding the political value of these tools, I don't believe that the short-term benefit to insurgents in pure coordination can be readily harnessed for uh, instrumental ends of statecraft. And then instead, the long game of using these tools to build up civil society and build up the public sphere uh, are where the real value is. And to end with, with Gideon's little observation, I think that um, Malcolm Gladwell, in a widely read article in The New Yorker, s said essentially these tools, and you know, it, picking especially on Twitter and Facebook, he didn't, he didn't mention mobile phones, which I thought was an important oversight, but these tools essentially allow for weak tie formation, uh, sort of people who casually know one another to come together for some kind of cause. Um, but weak tie formation has never actually achieved significant political change. And that, that criticism is correct, and it's true as far as it goes. 
but it doesn't go far enough to explain the situations we're currently seeing. Because what I think he missed is that people who already have strong ties or who want to build up strong ties with one another, the kind of deep bonds of trust that would let a group of people take political action, also use these tools. So although the tools do visibly privilege weak tie networks, the kind of casual association that can be thrown together quickly, they are not limited to weak tie networks. And that's essentially what I said both in the article and in a, in a response to um, Malcolm's response to the Foreign Affairs article that's, that's come out this month. Hold on one second. Let me just tweet that. Yeah. <laughs> okay. <coughs> Well, Anne-Marie, uh, you uh, uh, gave this wonderful speech on Internet freedom and so forth and have been uh, seized with these issues inside government. Why don't you tell us uh, how you think uh, about political power of social media, Internet freedom and so forth uh, from the perspective of U.S. foreign policy, uh, both in and out of government? Great. So first of all, it's great to be back. It's great to be able to speak, tweet, uh, <laughs> communicate in any of the many ways uh, that I can now once again communicate. Uh, I did not give the Internet Freedom Speech. The Secretary, of course, gave the Internet Freedom Speech. But uh, in the two years that I was in policy planning, I certainly think it was the most important speech uh, that I had the privilege of working on, and I worked on it uh, the very concept, the idea that she was going to give it, uh, and the speech itself with Alec Ross, who is her special advisor for innovation, uh, who is in, in the Twitter world known probably for his, he's got a vast following, and he truly uh, has been responsible for bringing the State Department uh, into the 21st century using these technologies. So it's really, in many ways, he thought very important for her, for the, for the United States, to make uh, this kind of statement, and many of us agreed, and I really do think it was a historic speech. And as I sat there listening to her, I was enormously proud that the United States was standing up two years before these revolutions and saying, we stand for the freedom to connect. Uh, we have always stood for freedom of expression. In the 21st century, the Internet is the town hall, the cafe, the, the uh, public square. Uh, it is the, the, the place that people come together, and part of what they do when they come together is to uh, assert themselves politically. That's only one of those things. Uh, and we were out there saying this isn't just a technology. It is a space, and it, there are rights, and it is the freedom to connect. And I think although I love Clay and his work, I think you're, you, this is a straw man because we never thought about it as you should be able to connect to the United States and download, download a template for democracy. I mean, mm -hmm. <laughs> uh, with due respect to our government, mm -hmm. right now I would not be advising anybody to download <laughs> our particular mm -hmm. uh, polarized right. system. Not at all. We thought of it as freedom to connect in three ways. Freedom to connect... Uh, to the Internet itself, to the idea that this is the space where things are happening, this is where people are living. They're living online and offline, and that's increasingly merging in various ways. And if you can't connect, you are simply being cut out of the 21st century world. So that very basic physical idea. And once you're on the Internet, you do have to be free to connect to any information you want. And some of that may be coming out of the West. Some of it is likely to be coming in from dissidents in your own society or commentators in your own society, but you've got to be able to connect to a free, full range of knowledge. And then third, you have to be able to connect to people. Mm -hmm. And that means to each other, and there I think the, the tremendous contribution of your article is talking about the basic nature of connection and how that builds civil society and how that gives people the courage uh, to do what they're afraid to do alone. I think absolutely the, the, the understanding of this technology uh, in, in, in part of connection is very important. But it's also about connecting to people outside because as you and I both know, because we've both been on Twitter for months now, looking at uh, the people who are inside different Arab countries who are, mm -hmm. are communicating out, much of which is being f filtered by a, just a couple of people who've played a huge role, mm -hmm. that goes out to us. In many cases, I get information off Twitter that I then send back to my former colleagues. So 
it's not about connecting to democracy. It's about connecting, first of all, to the internet itself, then to knowledge, then to other people inside and outside their societies. And I think we understood, as Secretary Clinton would say it, that diplomacy in the 21st century is not just about government to government. It is about government to society. It's about government to people. And what we did for two years was to work on all the different ways we can do that. And without internet freedom, that can't happen. So I what think I'll leave was it there. All the different ways you could do that, does that include leaking 250,000 uh, cables to uh, Julian Assange? <laughs> <laughs> Do not look at the State Department, thank you. Um, but if, but if right. information wants not, to be no, free no, no, no. and if, uh, well, I mean, if, if disclosure is good, the is good. I am, government to people, why isn't, that, uh, why isn't WikiLeaks a good thing? For the very same reason that as a lawyer, I, anybody comes to me as a lawyer expects confidentiality. I would have no business as a lawyer if I didn't uphold that, nor would a doctor, nor would a priest, nor would any other profession. Diplomats are no different. When you work with another government, they have the right to expect that that will be confidential. When a human rights activist works with you as a diplomat, they have the right to expect that that will be confidential because their lives are on the line. That had nothing to do with freedom of information. It had everything to do with the violation of confidentiality, which is criminal in some contexts and deeply damaging in others. Clay, I think you actually might have tweeted for Assange's defense fund or something. It uh, wasn't his defense fund. No, it was not Julian's defense fund. It was it was for WikiLeaks to keep the lights on. Um, so, so explain why Amory, what Anne Marie just said is wrong. Well, I, so I don't I don't disagree with Anne Marie's analysis. I disagree with the target, which is to say, uh, in as much as confidentiality is expected and and managed, it's managed by the people who have the clearance, who are asked to keep the secrets. And there we are discussing Bradley Manning, not WikiLeaks. And it's, I think the, the kind of slip here in the obvious comparison with the Pentagon Papers is that the people who consistently get lined up are not Ellsberg and Manning, but Ellsberg and Assange. And that, I think, is the wrong, that's the wrong unit of analysis that Manning, whatever one thinks of his actions as someone who, who whatever one thinks of his motivations in leaking, um, had been given secret clearance, had been given access to the Cipernet, and clearly violated that. Uh, the, the, the operative case from the Pentagon Papers, I am not a lawyer, but my read of it, I should say, is it's illegal to leak secrets, but it's not illegal to publish leaks. And that it's made even further, further removed from, from, uh, from that by, by it being a foreign national operating outside the United States. So when the extra legal harassment of WikiLeaks with the removal from the Amazon servers, and I think much more ominously, the removal from Visa and MasterCard's payment systems came along, that looked to me like a lack of due process and a failure of the rule of law, which is terrifying when you're dealing with the media. So when I saw MasterCard pull their support for WikiLeaks, I immediately pulled out my visa to give WikiLeaks 100 euros and, maybe more importantly, tweeted that I'd done that because my 100 euros is going to keep the server spinning for maybe another 15 minutes. But my telling 100,000 people that I had done that that, that, I think, had, had more effect. So, and, and, and I don't know how, how Anne-Marie feels about this, but the, 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 the tolerance of, and in some cases the enthusiastic participa participation <laughs> by some parts of the government, e.g. Senator Lieberman, for harassing WikiLeaks outside of the rule of law, not saying when, when Attorney General Holder decides to bring charges, then we will see what's going on. But, but the attempt to essentially silence someone because, or silence some, some site because we didn't like what was there, that is the kind of thing that I think if, if it had happened in China, we would rightly protest. And it's made doubly complicated by the fact that the vast majority of the world's international financial and large-scale internet systems are essentially within our local jurisdiction which suggests to me that we have to have an especially careful, right, purer than Caesar's wife kind of attitude towards our treatment here. Okay. okay. So yeah. that's that. I mean, that, Henry, do, that you have any, do you have any disagreement with that, that aspect of it? 
No, I mean, we were very, the State Department was very clear that we had nothing to do with micro, with uh, all the... With Lieberman's, yes. Well, with that or with Amazon or MasterCard. I mean, we were not out there trying to get people to, to uh, withhold from WikiLeaks. That would be direct interference in mm -hmm. what is clearly freedom of information. We did not do any of that. Our, our position was, was rather that there was a criminal act and that this that our position with respect to freedom of, the, of information and freedom of the Internet was, look, these are two very different things. We are, t we are saying you have the right to read what you want. You have the right to connect. We never said you don't have the right to go on WikiLeaks and read it. Of course you did. Our, our problem was that what happened that led to that was criminal. So, and we obviously denounced that. The secretary mm -hmm. spent months uh, repairing the damage. I, I, one thing I will say is that our response, the State Department's response, was very much informed by our awareness mm -hmm. of the difficulty of making sure that we had a line we thought we could draw. I mean, it, was, it wasn't like, oh, well, this is terrible. People, we knew that we were standing and in favor of Internet freedom, and this was complicated, and we, mm -hmm. we parsed it in, in various ways. Um, and I don't think... You know, we were not out there against Julian Assange. We were out there against how this mm -hmm. happened. Right. There is a question, which I don't think we want to debate here, to what extent WikiLeaks essentially suborns, to go back to my legal right. training, right. Uh, somebody like Bradley Manning to do this in the first place. Mm -hmm. But the, And at right. that point, then, of course, right. he, he bears responsibility, right. my too. Sense but I don't we don't know. I mean, I, I, I wrote something about WikiLeaks immediately, you know, as, as this, this part of the controversy was roiling, saying there may or may not be a crime here. I didn't, I didn't know that. I don't know now, partly because I stepped back from these questions. I'm not a lawyer, but also partly because the attorney general has not stepped forward to say, here is the crime and here's what it is. Okay. But it seems to me that in the absence of that, we ought to be, and, and, and that's, you know, getting to answer your question, that's why I, why I donated money and told people that I'd done it. We ought to be biased on the side of s protecting media outlets that publish things um, unless we're sure there's a crime. Okay. Let's move on from WikiLeaks back to the question about sort of the political power of uh, all this new technology, mm -hmm. uh, information and social media and so forth. Uh, we have a special section in our May-June issue coming out in a few weeks on, you know, what I'm calling the New Arab Revolt. We have an e-book coming out explaining all these things. In the initial breathless news reports, first of Tunisia and then particularly of Egypt, uh, there was massive coverage in the West about the role of the young, the, uh, the connected, the, the, the Facebook and Twitter people and so forth, and that this was the first, you know, every, now it's, you know, the if I hear one more, the revolution will not be tweeted or will be tweeted or what, it's going to get sick. Uh, but the, uh, Bill Scott Heron has the, a lot the first for cut it. of uh, history gave the Internet and social media vast amounts of credit for what happened and the upheavals that happened. Do you think that's valid? Uh, and do you think that when the true later story of these uh, eruptions and upheavals are written, will uh, social media and, and connectivity and things like that uh, be given as prominent a role uh, in the story when we know all the facts and we've had time to think about it and consider it as they were in the initial breathless days of uh, January and February and March. Right. Well, also, first of all, you first. Thing. Uh, I mean, as as you know, I've been thinking about this stuff for twenty years, and I can give a fully considered expert answer. We don't know uh, <laughs> uh, that that the sorting out of the various forces. I mean, Juan, Juan Cole has said this nicely: all revolutions are multiple revolutions at once. Right. The sorting out of the various forces and factors is going to be the work of doctoral dissertations for decades to come. Um, People will still be writing them the second, in the age of like they won't, 140 they won't be, characters? They won't be printing them, but they will be writing them. <laughs> the, the second thing that, that I'll say is that the prominence, that, that the prominence with which Twitter and Facebook were brought forward was, I think, wrong. I've never used the phrase Twitter revolution or Facebook revolution. They seem, they, they seem it's, un... It's demeaning. Right, exactly. They seem un, <laughs> un, un, unexplanatory and unhelpful. Um, but the other thing I'll say is that, the, that reading a lot of that writing, <coughs> there were relatively nuanced attempts to say 
There was a group of people that were educated, underemployed, angry, and the government had systematically tried to prevent them from synchronizing their grievances or coordinating their actions. And they, they <coughs> used these tools for leverage to pursue in, you know, deeply held political goals. And then the headline writer would get hold of it and say, Twitter revolution! Right? So that, in fact, many of the, the nominal claims about uh, the effect of, of the revolutionary effect of these technologies were made by the editors writing the headlines, and not actually the, the authors writing the articles. There was almost no one who says that Twitter caused otherwise satisfied Tunisians to suddenly turn out to see <laughs> Yazid, right? And yet, the, the, the counterclaim is ferociously put forward, as if there is a whole, a whole group of people who, who, who believe right. this. Um, well, let's construct the counterfactual. Had there not been the technological developments in social media in the last 10, 15 years, had there not been the widespread availability of social ways of connecting online, would these sorts of revolutions not have happened? So I'll say yes, uh, but probably not for the reason you're, th you're going to think. I do think that's true, but before I say that, I, as I've looked at all this, I've thought, you know, a moment of homage to our founding fathers, to George Washington, to Thomas Jefferson, to Lenin, people who managed to actually have very major revolutions without being able to synchronize at all. And I really have been thinking about what it was like in Moscow in 1917. I mean, this was huge, right? You overturned the czarist government for centuries and centuries. So a moment of appreciation for all those revolutionaries who managed to bring about enormous social change when it was a lot harder. Whether or it, not we like the change they brought about. I'm not... And I'm not equating our founding fathers with Lenin, but I'm just saying... Take those tweets back. Right. Get, take those there tweets back. There is a delete back. function. There's a, uh, but I, I really, have, I've been thinking about just what it was to be a band of revolutionaries and to have to actually bring people into the streets and make it happen. But what the reason I say yes is because the technology of oppression has increased dramatically. So the technology of liberation has to keep pace. So in the sense that given the tools that these governments have to completely block information, to shut things down, then unless you had the counter technology uh, of the social media, uh, then I don't think it could have happened. But that's just saying, you know, the, the printing press needed the, needed the Xerox machine. I mean, at, every, at any turn, you can see that the technology of oppression and the technology of liberation have to keep, keep track. That's not saying that, you know, it caused these revolutions in the sense that, you know, what right. caused them was absolutely the discontent, a lot of, in many ways, economic, political, and also some extraordinary courage of, of individuals who finally said they'd had enough. Let's not forget that you know, this vegetable seller in Tunisia, who was a university graduate who had, could not get a job, who was selling vegetables to support his family, uh, his sister in college, the rest of his family, who was being harassed by a policewoman uh, who took you know, his daily income, went and he didn't blow himself up and kill other people. He killed himself in an, one of the oldest acts of protest going. You know, that is extraordinary. And the original, the Egyptians who were willing to take Tahrir Square, I look at that. I'm a mother. I've got two children. Would I have been out there? No. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, so <clears throat> I'd love to keep talking to you guys forever. We have a lot of people who want to get in on this. We also have a lot of people online and uh, who want to get in on this. So let me start the Q&A uh, by asking just a couple of questions from, uh, from our Facebook and Twitter uh, followers. Uh, and, and one, I'll go a little bit, well, first, the first is uh, from Erwin Schatzker uh, via Facebook. And, and his argument it sort of piggybacks on what you just were saying, which is what can social media uh, do against regimes that are really willing to use violence against their people. Right. Well, is, you know, is, right. is Libya and Syria, right. are those the counter-arguments to the Tunisia we don't, Egypt optimism? We don't, we don't, but cer there's certainly, there are certainly some, some of the counter-arguments, as was the crushing of the Green Wave last, about this time last year in, in, in Iran. Um, and, and this, you know, I, I, I said this in the original Foreign Affairs piece, that 
uh, the, the failure of the yellow shirts in Thailand and of the Green Wave both uh, ran aground on the, on the willingness of the government to kill its own citizens. So uh, these, a, any advantage from synchronization, coordination uh, of, of you know, opinion and action uh, can still be seen off with violence. If a government is both willing and critically capable of killing its own citizens, ultimately it can see off any local threat. However, uh, at a certain point, uh, the, the, the economic ramifications of that over the much longer haul become, I think, really salient. It seems to me that what the Green Wave did in Iran is it tipped a military-backed theocracy into becoming a theogra- theocratically-backed military junta that the, the mullahs were unable to stop the green wave, but the besiege were, and that the, the, the events of, of, of essentially last, of December 09 through, through February of last year were the rise of the real military government, government in Iran. And Philip, uh, Philip Howard, who's written, I think, the best book on this subject called Digital Origins of Dictatorship and Democracy. It's a study of information and communications tools in the Middle East and North Africa. Um, says essentially the spread of these tools correlates positively with the citizen's ability to force the governments to be more representative, sometimes in large ways, sometimes in small ways, with one exception, when there is enough oil money to buy them off. So effectively, I think we're going to see three kinds of exceptions to the general use of these tools for citizens to press their, press their case. One, if the country is simply too poor, too dispersed, too agrarian, right? Don't expect Sierra Leone to blow any time in, you know, in the near future. The second is if the government is simply willing to brutalize its own people, it can for, for that time hold it down. I think that roughly describes the state of Iran. And the third is if there is simply enough money to provide the satisfaction that people are looking for from the political system, I think Saudi is the canonical case here, um, those, those are places where there are relatively effective counter moves. But if you want to be a modern economy, right, if you want to be even an industrial economy, you can no longer do it if the workers do not have cell phones in their pockets. And once they have that, you have handed over a degree of communicative freedom to them, un- unknown in the 20th century, right, at, 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 at that level of, of density and adoption. So the Saud will be able to buy themselves a third term. Who is this? <laughs> they also would. <laughs> uh, my, 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 you know, you, you don't want to make a, I mean, never, never make a prediction with both an outcome and a year. That's the sort of <laughs> academic rule, but um, my guess will be yes. Uh, Emery, your take on the... Well, I, I, I think absolutely that the key determinant is a willingness of its government to sh- shoot its own citizens. That's why the critical moment in Egypt uh, was precisely the army deciding, no, we will not do this. And a lot of the diplomacy behind the scenes, which I think the United States can be proud of, was we had very close ties uh, with many members of the Egyptian army, uh, our own military, their military, and there was a tremendous amount of back and forth in terms of what a professional military does. And a professional military does not fire on its own citizens. A professional military is there for the defense of its country uh, and not uh, for the the purpose of any particular regime. Uh, so that was a, a key turning point. Obviously, Gaddafi uh, had a, has had a very different view. One of the reasons I have made the argument that we had to intervene in Libya was that uh, it, once it hit that scale, if we didn't do anything, we were sending the message that not only violence worked and you could do violence at any of any order of magnitude, which really uh, is I, I, I don't think other regimes are, are following suit to that extent. And I, it, there is there's some critical that's a critical turning point. But let me just say the only other thing I would say here is that I think it gets harder to do mass violence with this technology. Mm -hmm. I mean, even the most repressive governments in history, some of the monsters of history, they don't do it out in the open. They hide it. I mean, remember, I'm of the generation that remembers Solzhenitsyn and the Gulag. You know, people didn't know what was happening. Russians did not know. If you had been able to show that, 
uh, as it was happening, if you had been able to show you know, the mass killings that we've had in history, it gets harder for governments to maintain the stories they tell about themselves. I mean, look, Gaddafi's up there standing there saying, everybody's happy here. He's not openly <laughs> saying, I'm shooting my citizens. So there, no matter what, there is the gap between word and deed that if you can use technology to show is there, at some point that weakens the grip on power, even for people who are used to, willing to use force. And, and Marie, can I ask you a question about this? And this is, I, 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 this is not a leading question. I genuinely don't know. To what degree do you think we've created a precedent in intervening in Libya that we will be held to? It, it's the now why not Bahrain question, essentially. Um, that when other states bring in uh, armed, armed reaction to, to citizen uprisings, is there, do you think there's an emerging doctrine about when we'll intervene, or is it really still case by case? Or? No, there is a doctrine, and it's set forth uh, by the UN Security Council. It's called the Responsibility to Protect, and gravity and magnitude of atrocities is built into the doctrine. The responsibility to protect says governments have the responsibility to protect their own people. And in situations of genocide, crimes against humanity, systematic and grave war crimes, or ethnic cleansing, mm -hmm. those are four very mm -hmm. you know, serious charges, then the international community has the right to intervene. So and that is built in, and that's why it's so important that the, the UN resolution explicitly refers right. to the responsibility to protect, which is not to say, and this is hard to talk about, that we do not think that the killing of ten, five, one, five, ten, a hundred is not very grave. But there's a difference between deploring sanctions, whatever else you can, and using force which will kill in its own right uh, as a countermeasure. Does so when, R2P, when Med well, hold on a second, does R2P, that creates a threshold for the right to go in. Does it, is it also, is it, a, is it a sufficient as well as a necessary cause? In other no. Words, the, no. So, no, so, I mean, that's why they, the number of atrocities that are being So you can have a situation that fulfilled the criteria you're talking about and still we wouldn't. Well, I mean, really this what this is. Veto. This is right. When Medvedev <laughs> thinks that's too dictatorial for me, that's when you're in trouble. Absolutely. That's, that's effectively the UN threshold. <laughs> okay. We, we have, the, I'm very tempted <laughs> to get this into Libya. You can say that. <laughs> Libya, we're I know, not right. going to. I'm, I'm, I'm outside. Right, we're I'm, not going to talk about Libya North unless guys, you want to talk so, about right. Libya. Right I'm now, not asking you to agree. But right now, let me throw it over to our audience here. We're waiting patiently to get in. Uh, so we'll uh, stand, stand, the... wait for your microphone and we'll uh, uh, state your name and keep your questions short. Uh, and uh, yes, in the back here. Hi, my name is Solana. I'm the editor of Global Voices Online. Um, I, I wanted to ask you both um, about ideology in these revolutionary movements, or perhaps the apparent absence of ideology, and whether you think it has anything to do with the sort of general social media environment, and whether it might, whether you think it might have anything to do with the um, the way that government will be carried forward in these post-revolutionary societies or in the transitional period. How will that absence of ideology or that um, general sort of uh, government of, so, you know, that politics of social media carry over? Yeah, it's a good question. That's, that's, yeah. So I think, I think, first of all, Frank Fukuyama is looking pretty prescient right now. Uh, the end of history argument suggested that given what was, uh, you know, given what works about liberal market economies, people will want in in as much as they're allowed to express their preferences. Um, and that's certainly not yet universal, but I think we've seen a surprising degree of agreement on that in, uh, in North Africa right now. I do think that social media had an effect here, and, and if I had to pick a sort of a couple of things to, to focus on, I'd say the Kafaya movement and the April 6th labor movement in, in Egypt, Kafaya dating back to 04, the April 6th movement to 08, each of which was an attempt not to coordinate with an ideology, but to coordinate rather with shared agreements among really ideologically dispersed Groups. Kafaya means enough in Egypt, and it was a movement 
uh, started largely in the in the blogosphere between secular pro democracy movement <coughs> and uh, uh, Islamists, all of whom could come together and agree that however much they disagreed about other things, they they all wanted Mubarak out. And where you know, I think to Anne Marie's point about about coordinating people when the communications was difficult. One of the things that did that was ideology, right? Habermas's famous observations about, about uh, ideology in the lead-up to the French Revolution. I think what these tools have allowed people to do is to come together around common cause without saying we have to all be part of one organization. The enormous, the enormous tension in all of this, also reflecting what Anne Marie is saying about the, the, the technologies of oppression having been amped up, the governments of that region, and I think autocratic governments the world over, have created a situation in which ordinary, what we know of as ordinary political dispute, dated from, you know, roughly pick, pick a date, 1688 to, to present, um, have, largely, have largely been broken. The kinds of things that would lead a group of people in the 18th, 19th, 20th century to, to protest against their government, those threats have largely been seen off. And so you get these looser less centralized, less hierarchical movements because no one can find and cut off the head. The problem is that there is no shadow government in waiting when the revolution be fully revolves. Right? El Baradai says, well, maybe my people are calling me back. He shows up. No, in fact not. Right? But he didn't, he didn't know that until he gets to Tahrir, right? because who, who knew? And so this, the, the real question now is, there is a period in history which we didn't used to have before, which is after the revolutionaries have won, but before it's clear who's taking over. And that, that is a new problem. That is a 21st century problem. And, you know, I, I, I don't know anyone in Egypt, but I have spoken to the, gov the, 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 the ministers coming into the Tunisian government, all of whom seem very focused on the fact that they threw the last guys out so they could throw us out too, all we're trying to do is hold the place together for six months so we can have an election that solidifies the Constitution. Uh, God willing and ensure a lot of that process will actually work itself out. But, but it is a problem that we haven't faced before. Can I just say two, yeah, I would. two things about it? One, I actually tweeted this today. There's a wonderful <laughs> piece, I think it's on your blog or in your magazine, I couldn't tell you, on uh, the, the importance of... Uh, bread prices, of agriculture, of food security. On our security. website. Don't have it's on your on. website. website. Okay. So I saw the article. It was tweeted to me. I retweeted it. I that. said it's a very important part of the story, and it's a very good piece. And one of the things it says, it talks about the democracies of bread, and it charts uh, in, in revolution after revolution the, the relationship between the price of food uh, and the, the revolutionary uh, fervor. Indeed, there's a wonderful quote that says, every society is only three meals away from a revolution. Napoleon. So I recommend that. Uh, but I have to say, at first when you asked your question, I thought, oh, that's right. And then I thought, wait a minute, there's a tremendous ideology. How on earth could we say these revolutions aren't driven by ideology? It's called life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. And it is a very <laughs> powerful ideology. It just happens to be an 18th century ideology, but it is the most powerful set of ideas mankind knows. And that is precisely what is driving the goals that these re that the, the protesters are calling for, that doesn't mean that's the underlying cause. I mean, the underlying cause, I do think, is also, uh, it's about the right to have the basic opportunities that human beings do the world over, and they're able to see that they don't have them, and, and the economic situation is such that, that, that it's, uh, you actually have to demonstrate, I mean, there is no possibility of being bought off. So it's a complex of economic and political factors. And yet, Despite what both of you just said, when Egypt just had its first major vote after the revolution, mm -hmm. uh, we didn't see either chaos or a bunch of nice mm -hmm. uh, young uh, techno liberals coming out. We saw a victory by forces that uh, were not necessarily the forces behind the revolution and not necessarily the forces who were favorable to the goals of the revolution. You mm -hmm. saw Muslim Brotherhood and you saw Islamist parties, you saw army and uh, uh, well, no, the Muslim Brotherhood. I, the Muslim Brotherhood participated in the revolution in that they were part of the Kafaya movement. So I don't. Yeah, I wouldn't go so far as to say that they somehow came out of nowhere. And I also don't think that's despite. I think that I think it's exactly this scenario in which 
the breaking of the old system and the building of the new system are now being done by different kinds of actors. And that's, that's the 21st century problem. Yes, over here. My name is Charlie Rose, but I'm not the guy in television. <laughs> uh, I manage money for a living, sometimes better than others. Uh, it seems to me that we're living in a world where we're uh, realizing the failure of government and the failure of failed governments to have their people, as you said, be fed, have clothes, have jobs. Uh, we're living in a world where both the West and the East are having failed governments on many, many levels. However, you are, if you, if you look at the emerging economies, obviously the BRIC countries, the BRIC countries have not changed, and particularly China, have not changed their authoritarian char characteristics, but there's been a liberalization of their economy. And could there be a situation in these other emerging countries, we'll use a polite word for them, uh, whereby you don't change their government, but you change their character of investment, wealth creation. They have educated populations, young people, very young populations in the Arab world. I've traveled around the Arab world myself. So the question I have for you is that could you have an economic revolution and not a government or a political system change? Hmm. I, I, I don't think so. I say this in the article. I, I'm short China. Um, in fact, I just, just bet $100 they won't, that this Chinese Communist Party won't be, won't be in charge in, 100, in 10 years. 100 years. $100, $100 that they won't be in charge in 10 years. Um, we've, never seen a, um, we've never seen an industrialized autocracy last longer than 70 years. So I think there is something inimical in economic freedom to political unfreedom. Um, in, and, and, and one of the things that really changed my view on this was the Philip Howard book I was referencing earlier, uh, Digital Origins of Dictatorship and Democracy, in which he doesn't talk about democratization, yes or no, do you have it or do you not. If you look, if you ask that question, you look at China, China, you know, no 10 years ago, still no now. But if you look at it as actions in which the government either becomes more or less responsive to its people, China has had an enormous number of activities in which they've become more responsive more. to their people much, much because at the local level they have to root out corruption and they have to have responsible. What they're trying to do is essentially, <coughs> uh, you know, uh, creamy democratic center, crunchy authoritarian crust or whatever, so that you, you get the good aspects of a, a working government that's responsible to its people at the level of the the town and the province without threatening the party at the top. But I I think that they, you know, and, and, and this thing I'm saying about, you know, not being able to hide these things, right? The Sichuan quake of 2008, which brought about spontaneous uh, protests from the middle class when the schools collapsed and killed the children, which, of course, left those families childless, uh, the last time there'd been an earthquake of that magnitude, the Chinese government had been able to deny that it had happened for three months. This time, they learned about it from their own citizens posting photos and videos to Ren Ren and QQ and the various Chinese social media services. So I think that China is, in fact, if you look at it at, at the, you know, if you, if you stand in Tiananmen Square and look in concentric circles, no, not much change. But if you look at the level of responsiveness that's being either forced on them or that they are themselves forcing at the lower levels, they're a dramatically more responsive government than they used to be. And I'm, I'm betting that they will fail at this attempt to have responsiveness at the bottom level and autocracy at the top. Okay, Amory, but well, hold on a second. Oh, excuse me one second. Uh, Amory, before you uprooted your family and took them to that strange place called Washington, you uprooted them. I never you, uprooted them. them. Excuse me, I commuted right. for two years, which That's is right. why I'm back. Yeah. Uh, uh, <laughs> before that, you, up, you did uproot them and, and took them, them to them that to strange Shanghai. place called yes. China. Uh, so uh, what, what is your take on, on the stuff Clay was just saying, given that you were actually there on the ground for a year? And by the way, we have a, uh, if you could talk, one of our Facebook questions is, what are the prospects for social media in China? So touch on those. So, 
The first thing I will say is I, I definitely agree with, with Clay that the, uh, the liberalization uh, of uh, Chinese society in terms of allowing participation at the local level is quite dramatic. The other, on the other hand, China is very worried. And one thing that is not, be, I think, being paid attention enough to right now is China is systematically arresting top bloggers uh, and shutting down internet cafes. And everyone is focused on the Middle East. It is very clear the Chinese government is extremely worried and individuals are paying that price. It is tightening uh, day by day. I'm not sure I would, I would, uh, I mean, I, I think I might take your bet. And if I did, it would simply be that living in China is to understanding a country that has suffered so much through social instability mm -hmm. that it, it, it's a, it's a different point of departure than for Americans. We have always, we obviously had a terrible civil war, but otherwise we've never had the country fall apart, be put back together. We've never had the government loose hordes on people and send them uh, both killing and, and displacing people so that there is such a desire for stability. And why did 70 percent of Egyptians vote for the constitutional changes put before them, the same desire for stability, the ability to live their lives without violence, without chaos, may allow an evolution rather than a revolution. Uh, but it, if so, I think it is because of something very deep in the national psyche. Okay, let's take two more questions, wrap it up. Uh, here and here, because you had your hand up before. Hi, Rich Robbins. I'm really interested in the threshold you were talking about for right to protect. And one thing you didn't talk about, which gets back to what Clay was saying about the, um, the capabilities of these new connective technologies, does access to world leaders through digital uh, play a big role in triggering the right to protect? And I would say, by I all mean means, it would. So. I, and you had tweeted to me last week that because of I, I was wondering Garvin, if you're that. <laughs> I, I'm that guy. <laughs> yeah, uh, you're that guy. <laughs> so you answered a question last week that because Andy Carvin was amplifying voices in Libya, it most likely had an impact in uh, the State Department and other foreign governments in just seeing the atrocities that were happening and causing world governments to want to intervene. Does that become part of the threshold that if you can get your voices amplified enough by Andy or by other forces, the world leaders are more likely to, uh, to step in. And what are the implications of that? What are the dangers of countries that aren't as connected? Are they more able to? Uh, Hold on a second. Good a second one here. Right. A weak tie just became a stronger tie. Yeah. <laughs> Hi, um, my name is Regina Joseph. I'm a master's candidate at the NYU Center for Global Affairs. And my question, you, you touched upon the technology of liberation, and you almost touched on technology of oppression. Mm -hmm. And I'm curious to hear your perspectives on the issue of the primacy of the pipes, the corporate and the state interests that control the access. Mm -hmm. For example, in Egypt, they, for a week, they shut down mm -hmm. wireless access. Mm -hmm. So even if you have the capability to synchronize groups, mm -hmm. the ability of that synchronization sometimes gets cut off. Mm -hmm. And in the case of the state's responsibility, for example, in the U.S., the FCC just last month basically provided a certain measure of net neutrality to fixed line access mm -hmm. providers, but to the wireless carriers, which mm -hmm. ultimately will be the biggest access point for most people in the future, essentially gave the carriers carte blanche. So, you know, creating that price point, how are people going to access in the future? How, how do you make that possible? In the so Anne-Marie on R2P. Yeah, I was going to say, I'm, I'm we'll do better, yeah. you're better, yeah. on, and, better uh, on pipes. You know, so, and then you can also include whatever final thoughts you have before we head over to the bar for non-virtual uh, uh, I hope not. <laughs> yeah, the day wine goes virtual is the yeah. day. <laughs> <laughs> um, so the, the thresholds, uh, are built in. You're absolutely right that effectively what's happening through the people who have been amplifying Libyan voices is they've made it uh, impossible to deny uh, the, the brutality of what's going on. Now, even so, it wasn't until 
he, his forces were on the edge of Gaddafi, and it was clear that you had a town of 700,000, and he was threatening to go door to door, as the president just said. Now, that you could see without cell phones. I mean, we, we could just see that. But on the other hand, we'd seen enough to know that he was going to keep his word, and we'd seen that uh, through individual pictures. But I think you make a very important point that there are countries and places where crimes against humanities are undoubtedly being committed, and we do not know about them, or we do not know about them in ways that people who can then make a difference when they do know about them can actually act. Uh, and that's a different kind of digital divide and a very tragic one. Does that mean, let me just follow up on that for a second, does that mean that as uh, information technology spreads, as knowledge spreads, and in real time, that uh, since you're not going to discover that fewer bad things are happening, <laughs> uh, does that mean that the odds uh, are that we will see interventions, more interventions in more places because we'll now be aware of more problems that need to be solved? Yes, I mean, and, and indeed, you are seeing right now, I, I don't, not sure you would have had a UN resolution on the Ivory Coast last night if you hadn't had a UN resolution on Libya uh, before. You can't stand there and say, look, we're going to act because 700,000 Libyans are imperiled, and then see similar numbers in the Ivory Coast and not act. Now, does that mean we're going to send in force all the time? Again, the barriers against that are very, very high, but are we going to intervene in, ver in various ways and ultimately? Ultimately, more use of international force in a humanitarian capacity, yes. I bet that it'll depend on how Libya is seen in retrospect. Well, I, I, if, I, Libya, I, if Libya is not seen to be a success in retrospect, that it will actually set back the prospects of uh, future interventions. But we'll, to, to be done in the future, that. kind of thing. Yeah. Uh, Clay? So the, the net neutrality question, I, I, certainly the U.S.'s inability to create a situation where uh, the essentially what made the internet work, the lack of discrimination, isn't uh, isn't part of the framework for wireless. is a huge threat for us, and would be a threat anywhere it appeared. Um, funnily enough, in 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 many countries, the the provisioning of net neutrality is actually much better than here. A little bit like our disastrous cell phone infrastructure. We're we're not, you know, uh, we're 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 behind. In terms of the the. The, the conversation here about about autocratic regimes. The the answer to bad pipes is more pipes, right? Not to because there's no guarantee. If there is a piece of glass under your soil, there is no guarantee you can create that you're not just going to cut that glass, right? If the ISPs in Egypt had not responded to big guys showing up with guns at their door and shut it down. Uh, we know from trawlers dredging outside of Alexandria that it's possible to cut those cables because it happened three times in the middle of the decade. So they could have simply physically disconnected. Consistently, the story is when there are large physical disconnects at the level of the pipes that somebody uses radio repeators, somebody uses low Earth orbit satellites, satellite phones. Um, the, the threshold isn't narrowband or broadband. The threshold is connected at all or not. And so rather than saying we have to find some way to defend glass and copper running through autocratic regimes, which we can't do. You simply, it's not physically possible. We have to provision a lot of different ways for people to connect because it's the overlap of alternative systems rather than any sort of nominal legal hardening because autocrats are untrustworthy when it comes to legal agreements. The much bigger threat is at the application layer. It's not about are, is the glass intact or not. It's about how does Facebook feel about having people hold up in Arabic signs in Tahrir Square that say, thank you, Facebook, when they're negotiating to get into <laughs> China, right? That's, that's where the bigger risk is. We don't, we talk about, I talk about, a public sphere. We don't actually have a public sphere online. We have a corporate sphere that tolerates public speech to a first approximation. Some people do it badly. Uh, some people do it well. Twitter has been astonishingly good on asking to inform people when they are being subpoenaed and so forth. So they've, Twitter has done an amazingly good job of standing up for what it considered to be the civil rights of its, of its users. But that is still only a business decision. So we are in, in, in this moment in a situation roughly like the Vietnam War protests at the end of the 1960s 
where the debate, principally in California, around what free speech rights attached to malls, mm -hmm. which were also privately owned. I remember those cases. Yeah, exactly, and ended up with a Pruneyard decision where essentially there's a high degree of regional variability. But we're heading for that, except a legal framework in which any such decision would happen has to be international. So the, 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 the question, I think, isn't so much about connectivity. I mean, it didn't work for Egypt to shut down the Internet, and they couldn't because by that time it was too late. And if you were to shut down the Internet any time there was a threat, there would have been no Internet access in Egypt for the last 15 years. So those, those economic effects keep connectivity at a relatively moderate level, but it's the... It's the ability to actually use the tools they want to use on a day-to-day -day basis to speak where the threat is, 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 I think, being manifest and where the really hard foreign policy question is. Okay. I, we really have to shut this down, but I want to just take one more question, uh, one, a time for one more question, because as I'm sitting here listening to you guys. It, it strikes me, I, I'm curious to zoom out for a second. I mean, Clay, you've been this sort of techno-optimist uh, for as long as I've known you, envisioning some future world that's sort of but I've way stopped. beyond now I'm envisioning where we are the present. Now. Exactly. I'm, I'm done envisioning the future. I, I, don't, I don't know if you're one of these singularity types or not. No, like no, my brother, no. But... Ix nay on the singularity. That's, okay. that's ridiculous. But, Anne-Marie, you're, you're, from, you're from the world that's, that's my world, that it's a very traditional world. We're sitting here in the Council on Foreign Relations, which is, you know, nearly a century old. And, you know, foreign affairs is 90 years old. And it's filled with a bunch of, you know, old white males, traditionally no longer anymore, but in the old days, they're sitting around reading, writing several thousand word articles for a, a journal that's, you know, made on chewed up trees. George Kennan writing the X exactly. article and you're the on foreign affairs. So here's my go. question. Are we really, and to zoom out for a second, I mean, is this stuff that we're discussing tonight and the little changes that we're talking about in our practice, things, are we really undergoing the kind of massive world historical revolution in our lives that the sort of uh, technology optimists have been uh, telling us that's going to come? And will things, if we have you guys back 10, 20 years from now, Will it be dramatically different in a whole variety of ways? Will the world around us be dramatically different in ways that were not true of the last sort of, you know, 50 or 60 years? Is this, has, the, has the pace of change in international relations, in technology, in life, in, in the world, is it speeding up so much that, that by the time we grown-ups, you know, semi-grown-ups like us, uh, uh, <laughs> uh, reach the end of our natural lives, we will no longer recognize, you know, the, the world that we, the, the, that we grew up in? So I... I think we are. I really. I think in the world of international relations, I'm not going to. That's my expertise. I'm not going to go beyond. And I don't think that means utopia. I mean, but I fundamentally think that we are moving from a world in which international relations was the relations between states. It's built right into the title, internation to a world in which international relations, even as conducted by governments, so this isn't just you know, transnational networks all over the place, uh, even as conducted by governments, is now, now has to focus on both governments and societies. That means that you have to do diplomacy, you continue to do diplomacy. You also have to do development, and development is every bit as important as diplomacy because you are focusing on the conditions of people's lives. That means when you're talking about governments, you talk about who's ever in the government. If you're talking about societies, you'd better focus on half the society, women. Right? You, you cannot engage a society and ignore half of it. You have to engage public-private partnerships. You have to engage all of our society in connecting to other societies. So at least with respect to our discipline, I think the kinds of articles, the kind of diplomacy, the very way we recruit uh, and we conduct our foreign policy is changing fundamentally. And I will give only you know, one example that, you know, as part of that we, we did the Internet Freedom Speech, but equally we pull together uh, competitions for apps for Africa. How could you, what would be the best apps to help different people in different societies in Africa do what they needed to do? Now, you could say, well, sure, you know, 90 years ago, nobody knew what an app was. I'm saying it's not just about the technology. It's about the idea that the U.S. State Department is running a competition to find what are the best applications to help people on the ground in Kenya, in Uganda, in other countries. So I think there's a sea change or a paradigm shift or something, however grand you want to make it. I think. Last word, but keep it short. Um, 
So I'll follow, I'll follow this and say that one of the things that I have consistently tried to say to people thinking about international relations is that uh, non-state actor increasingly sounds like horseless carriage. <laughs> Like, it's going to be just like it was, except with, you know, it, 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 you're defining, you're defining well it by negation. And in fact, the, the active line. presence of these non-state actors, as, as we're asked to call them, is, is, increasingly, is increasingly salient. Um, let, me, let me end with an observation that I think comes from, comes from one of the audience members. Global Voices is astonishing. Global Voices set up to say... We could increase awareness among English language readers by simply translating parts of the blogosphere not written in English and making that material more salient politically. And that is the kind of idea you couldn't even have had. Right? The foreign, you know, the FBIS, the, the broad, Broadcast Board of Governors, the people who are doing that translation could never have hoped to distribute it at the scale that Global Voices is doing. And I don't, so, so I don't want to sign up for any kind of grand monotonic change so much as the accumulation of ideas like that. I think if we come back in 10 years, we're going to have had another decade of big surprises. Translating interesting thoughts and ideas into English so that they can have the impact that they deserve. Gee, it sounds like what the editors at Foreign Affairs do every day. <laughs> uh, with that, That's thank very you very nice. much. <laughs> Bravo. Thank you. That was thank truly you. witty. <laughs>